everybody welcome to the fired up with cj show today we have claudia black and we are talking about her book it will never happen to me growing with up with addiction as youngsters adolescents and adults so welcome back claudia thank you cj so um in the last segment um you were saying that there's just different there's different perspectives right if you're the addict you have your own sense beliefs about who you are um, and then shame and fear around those things. I was wondering if we could touch upon what those things are for if you have an addiction. And as you were saying in the previous segment, this is probably something that you saw in your family system. So you're just repeating mm -hmm. in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to the addicted person, and again, it can vary. And you can see some real differences sometimes between your male and your female who, who's addicted. And I think that what people sometimes don't really understand is that being addicted isn't about willpower and it's not about self-control. And if it was, so many of these people would be the last people to become addicted because in their behavior, um, if they allow themselves to really think about how their behavior is impacting others, they would be abhorred about that. And, but, the addiction itself cannot allow that to happen because their need to use is actually too great um, for them just to be able to stop if they would want to stop, which is why we say people really do need some level of help to be able to stop because there's such a psychological drive and pull to keep going back to whatever that behavior is. And so as you see people get sober, you this is when they can begin to talk about sober or clean. This is what begin the self hate is so great um, because they, for the first time, can see how their behavior, you know, the, the child doesn't want to have a relationship with them. Their spouse is afraid of them. Everybody's walking on eggshells. So most of the shame you see is should they find any kind of abstinence. And if they don't have a recovery practice and they have any kind of abstinence, they're more apt to get in touch with, you know, with again, the bottom line belief, who I am is not okay. I am a bad person. And a part of working with addicts is what you did was hurtful. Um, the behavior you can label as bad, but that does not mean you are bad. You know, I really believe that so much of the behavior that takes place would not have happened had they not had an active addiction, but they need a lot of support and messaging to really come to terms with that. And at the same time, other people have been impacted. And so oftentimes family members, partners and spouses, and even kids, you know, wanna say, oh, it wasn't that bad, or mom or dad, you really didn't hurt me because I don't want you to feel bad because I don't want you to go out and use anymore. Oh. And but the truth is they have been impacted and they have been hurt. And that's why we say the whole family needs a treatment process. The whole family needs a recovery process. And uh, the whole family needs to really be able to own their truth and their own reality. Now, that doesn't always mean that they are going to confront the addict with it, or there may be a certain time where it's more appropriate in which to confront them with these are the ways in which your behavior is hurt me. Mm. Um, so that needs to really be facilitated with, with a, a good therapist and counselor that understands. Mm. So when it comes to the spouse, you know, kids can be as affected by the behavior of the other parent who's not addicted as they are the addicted person. Mm. Mm. Now, I mean, I can say growing up in my family, it was my father who was touchy in a loving way. My mother, she didn't, she was not affectionate with me. Mm -hmm. And so... I today value touch a lot and, and use it well. And I got that from a father who was alcoholic and became very violent. But in his early years, that was that affection um, was, was real. And so, in, so what I'm really getting to in some ways um, that you can be more impacted or equally as impacted by the non-addicted parent because one, they may be rageful. They may be very angry about the situation they don't understand. They often have their own sense of guilt. They certainly think that they, if I had been a better wife, if I had been a better husband, had I just not gone on those work trips, had I just not done this, had I done this more? I mean, they're very much into their own self-blame, but that's too painful. So what I do is I compensate for it. 
And I compensate for it maybe with anger and rage. I compensate for it by being rigid and controlling with my kids. Um, I compensate maybe by my own uh, using something to anesthetize me because I don't know how to cope with this anymore. I uh, allow my children to become my best buddies and I give up my parental role with them, which causes a lot of enmeshment at times um, with kids, which isn't healthy. So you're gonna have both parents, even if one's mm -hmm. not addicted, who have an impact on these kids. And sometimes I work with kids who um, feel much more connected and attached to the addicted parent and maybe very angry with the mom. Um, you know, I had a young girl, a young woman not too long ago, who said, my dad got sober when I was 12, and she said, I just thought everything would be fine. I mean, he got sober, he went to a treatment program, and he's, you know, staying sober, and I thought everyone would be fine, and my mother had done nothing but rant and rave for three or four years, and she said, and she just kept doing it after he was sober, and then she left the home to go be with her boyfriend, and she said, and that's when I gave up. That's when I started my own binge drinking. That's when I started, you know, acting out sexually. And so you had a woman that ultimately went outside of the commitment, um, probably in her own anger and maybe her own needs and found herself a boyfriend. And then, and then you, the anger was herself, the anger was, was her husband, and then the kids got the brunt of that anger. Yeah, and, and the thing that you had said in the first segment is that these are things that are repeated because the, let's say the, in that scenario, the husband um, picked a certain wife that would repeat this whole scenario. So in, in, in that particular case, it was a, and it sounds like she was kind of emotionally having issues as well. Like what, is there a certain pattern that you see that keeps on repeating because you marry a spouse what is it the spouse that you're looking for what yeah. happens usually you're looking for a spouse that's already learned how to tolerate inappropriate behavior uh, a spouse that's learned to discount his or her perceptions and to give other people the benefit of the doubt mm. a spouse who's learned how to look cheerful even when he or she is hurting mm. a spouse who's learned that it's not been safe to ask for help um, it wouldn't dawn on me to ask for help. Help wasn't available at another time. Um, and I hear so many people say, well, I didn't want help. I just wanted he or she to stop. Mm. Um, and so those are the predominant, um, uh, you usually want a spouse that is a fearful of conflict, possibly mm. fearful of anger. Somebody all I have to do is raise my voice and she backs up and backs down. Mm. You know, I, I was working with sex addiction and one man said, um, he said, I'd build up my defenses before I came home. And she was looking for me to talk her out of her suspicions. And so again, uh, that would be another dynamic. I don't, I want to trust you. I can't trust myself. And if he verbally verbalizes this well enough, and he said, I was like a good defense attorney and I knew how to do it because she didn't want to believe it to begin with. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's another phenomena that permeates these children, spouses, partners, and, and the addicted. We talk about the addicted having denial, the addicted person having their own denial process. Family members do too. They learn to minimize, discount, rationalize. And as a little nine-year-old said to me, well, you see, in our family, we just pretend things are different than how they really are. Mm -hmm. So... Sometimes the addict is going to really find themselves attracted to and in need of somebody who's already learned how to rationalize, how to minimize, discount, and pretend things are different than how they really are. Mm. Wow. And, you know, and I want to go back to the shame piece with the kids. Um, it only makes sense that we want to minimize and discount um, versus to live with, I lack value, who I am is not okay, I'm not good enough. I'm insecure, right. I'm damaged. So I find ways to cope. And in this addicted family, kids take on roles. And all families take on roles, people within the family. But what makes it different in this kind of family is we ascribe to the role rigidly because of the fear and the shame. Uh, okay. And actually, let's talk about the kids in the next segment, just so that we can cover that separately. But I think we've we've been talking to. I'm sorry for interrupting. That's I just want to. 
There's so much wonderful information. We've been talking to Claudia Black about her book, It Will Never Happen to Me, Growing Up with Addiction as a Youngster, as Youngsters, Adults, Adolescents and Adults, excuse me. And um, in the next segment, we're going to talk about kids and the various roles that they play in this dynamic. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.